it's like another person looking at us there. Just in the background vocal, but they're like sitting there like they're so good. That's so cute. Hi everyone, so today we are joined with Tara Simon. Uh, she is a celebrity vocal coach and she's the owner of Tara Simon Studios, which is a private performing art studios. Thanks a lot for joining us, Tara. Thank you so much for having me, Simon. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So the first question would be, um, how did you start to learn how to sing? <laughs> well, um... So I, I do believe that singing is, um, is also a God-given gift as well as something that can be learned. So I was singing in my car seat before I could even really walk. And I was singing on stage since I was three, obviously with no formal training then. Um, I had been performing on stage for years before I actually received formal training at the age of, I think, seven or maybe six and a half, close to seven, um, where I sang uh, for a vocal coach for the first time. Um, so I've been doing it really essentially all my life, um, before I even knew what I was doing. Um, and it's just something I've, I've been designed to do and, and love to do. And, and uh, as a coach now, I find it's very interesting, the transformation of my purpose and my calling. I, I thought I grew up, um, thinking that I was going to be a singer, you know, my, my entire yeah. life. And, and although I am very much so, um, my real sweet spot in life is to also elevate others and equipping them with the tools that I've learned throughout my experience as a vocalist uh, to be successful vocalists themselves and to be fulfilled in their dreams. So it's very fulfilling for me to be able to assist in that. Okay, so I think you play piano as well? I right? do. Piano. Okay, so yeah, how important is it to play another in instrument as well of singing? Does it help? Absolutely. In fact, um, I always like to tell my students the story when they don't want to take piano. I have quite a few very, very well-known um, vocalists who <laughs> do not want to learn how to play an instrument. And I keep telling them, listen, when I was in New York auditioning for Broadway, the line was wrapped around the building for auditions for fame. And the one thing that differentiated me from everybody else was the fact that when I got called back, they said, oh, well, will you come tomorrow? And I said, no. And they're like, well, what do you mean? Like everybody that gets called back is going to come tomorrow. And I'm like, listen, I've been waiting here for eight hours in a cattle call. I've missed four other auditions. And if you don't mind, give me that sheet music right now and give me five minutes and I'll be right back to sing you the, cat the callback music. And the director looked at me like, uh, you got to be crazy. He gave me a stack of music. Uh, two songs, two full songs, about three and a half, four minutes long. And I said, I'll be right back. And so they kept auditioning and did their process. And I went to a piano in Ripley Greer Studios in New York City. And I plunked out the melody line of, of the song. And then I listened to it really quick to get, you know, the, the tracking, the instrumental down, the rhythm and all that stuff. And I went back in there and um, <laughs> I threw the sheet music down and sang the songs. And I got the part. Right. And, wow. and that's what separated me. I, you know, there's a lot of good vocalists out there, but are you, are you part of the music industry as a musician and as a business? Are you, are you a comprehensive product to sell instead of something that's just half baked? And by me being able to do that, I was able to subliminally tell that director, Hey, hire me, not because I'm the prettiest or because I'm the best singer, but because I'm going to make your job really, really easy. Right. Yeah. Like, I already knew the songs in, in just a few minutes. And so, so that is, that is what I try to impart to my students. Look, I'm not just telling you to learn an instrument or to be a, a well-rounded artist because it's going to make you take lessons longer. Um, what I really want is for you to be hireable. And I really want you to recoup your investment in what you're doing right now so that when you go out and audition, you can prove your value to someone over that person who decided, mm, yeah, I'm just a really good singer and that's what I do. That's fine if it's really that's all you want to do. But just know there are people out there like me and people out there like me who are training other people to be like yeah. me who may beat you out because, again, it's not about you. At the end of the day, when you're auditioning for someone, it's about the person who's hiring you and there are million things uh, on the list of what they have to do, and you're just one more of them. And the sooner artists understand that, I think the, the more roles they're going to get. 
Really interesting. Thanks a lot. And with this anecdote, I think we can really see that you have a strong personality as well. Yes. And <laughs> so I think the question that would be kind of logical after that is uh, what kind of qualities do you need in order to be successful in this kind of career? Absolutely. That's a great question. And it's got quite a large answer. Um, so I always tell my students it takes about 10,000 no's to get to one really good yes. And so the first quality that you have to have really honestly above talent is resilience. And the second is perseverance. And the third is stubbornness. <laughs> uh, okay. You need to be able to believe in yourself so much that when you get told no, it's not a deterrent. It is an encourager. It only fuels the fire underneath you to continue to go to get to that one yes that builds upon the snowball effect of all the right yeses. Um, and so if, if you're that person who is sensitive, who does not have thick skin, who cannot be criticized constructively, this is not the industry for you. Run in the opposite direction as fast as you can. If you're that person who, when you're told no, you're like, hmm, that just means I have to get a little more creative and find a way around that. This is definitely the career for you if you have the talent and want to pursue it. Um, so really, it's, it's that stick to itiveness that's really the most important. I have um, personal friends who I went to a performing arts high school with, and they never got any leads. They were always at the in the chorus at best. But these people um, who are my age who moved to New York, it took them years, maybe five, six, seven, maybe even eight years, but they're now on Broadway. And yes, they may be in the chorus, or yes, they may be a supporting, they may never get to a lead role uh, because the level of talent doesn't equal, but they're still there, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that perseverance, that stick to um, sometimes in a lot of cases supersedes the raw natural talent just because they continue to pound those doors down. Great. So I wanted to ask you as well, um, why did you decide uh, to uh, audition for X Factor? <laughs> well, I didn't decide to. I was... <laughs> really? <laughs> That's a funny story. So, okay. Um, growing up, there was a friend of mine who, um, who was very near and dear to my heart. And his mother was dying of ovarian cancer. And when she was dying she was in remission. And when she, she relapsed, we knew that she was most likely not going to survive. And he came over to my house and he was so distraught and, uh, he played guitar and really all, all I know, I mean, singing is my love language. Right. And so, so he just played the guitar, he played this lick and I just started singing over it. And I wrote a song. We, we wrote a song for his mother. She was really honestly one of those beautiful women. I think she was Miss Hawaii or something back in the day. And we wrote this song called beauty queen for her. And, um, it got a lot of response in my local area unintentionally. I mean, people heard it at her funeral. She heard it before she died. It was very touching. And, um, and it just kind of started to spread. Um, and I got a lot of requests at the time to please do more music like this. And at the time, I didn't have a whole lot of money uh, lying around extra. So I was like, well, I really kind of can't afford to do more of this because I spent a lot of money making that song great, like producing it well. And um, so I started a Kickstarter project and my sister, who's a pilot, um, anonymously invested and her pilot friend who kind of dedicates part of his life to helping boost up others, his name is Bob Rasky, uh, he also donated. And so I, I more than met my goal. And I later found out that my sister was one of the other main donors, which was really special to me. But Bob, um, you know, on Kickstarter starters, you have to pay people back yes. and, and rewards. And so he said, I had all these rewards listed and he donated so much money. I was like, whatever you want, like you can have them all, you know? And, and he flew to Atlanta where I was living at the time full time and said, um, I don't want any of your rewards. He, he took me to dinner and I was like, what do you want? You know, I'm kind of like on edge at this point, you know, it's the music industry after all. So what, what do you want out of me? And, um, he's like, I just want you to audition for every one of these nationally televised talent competitions out there this year. And I said, I can't. And he's like, why? He's like, I said, well, I can't afford to get to all of them. They're everywhere. Right. And he's like, it's fine. I'll pilot. I'll, I'll fly you there. And I was oh. like, Ugh. he's like, in fact, I'll go with you. And I said, okay, fine. And he was kind of an older gentleman. And so I thought, eh, he's not going to know, you know, all of them. I'll maybe do one or two and that's it. And then the next day he sent me an Excel spreadsheet with the dates and places of every single one of them. Um, 
America's Got Talent was the first. I didn't make it past the first callback. I'm not their type, clearly, and that's totally fine. Although Angelica Hale, who's one of my students, did yeah. top two, so that's awesome. Um, but uh, X Factor was the next audition, and I was sure, I never win these things, you know, and I was sure that I was not gonna make it, you know, so I just really sort of undersung. I think I sang uh, an original song and then Bruno Mars' Lazy Song just because whatever, you know, okay. and calling me back and calling me back and calling me back. And what was so special about the callbacks was not the fact that I got called back. It was the fact that you're in this big stadium and you, if you make it, you go right, uh, left. And if you don't, you go right. Um, well, Bob was waiting on the left side already, like all the way around the stadium, like knowing that just in faith I was going to get called back. And that was so sweet and special to me that I'm like, how did you know? He's like, I just knew. I'm like, well, it would have been a long walk of shame if you were on the wrong side and you had to meet me on the, the I didn't get called back side. So that's how I got on X Factor. It wasn't this lifelong dream of like, I want to be on TV and no, I, I wrote a song and I had to pay a guy back. And that's how I ended up on X Factor. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Things, so, yeah. but I guess you learned a lot. So, why did you learn from this experience? So much. Um, first of all, uh, the main thing I learned is how you can be portrayed on television and how polar opposite that can be of who you really are. Um, X Factor was a, a really wonderful experience while filming for me. Um, in fact, I had producers come to me. Um, while I was off hours in my hotel room thanking me because as a vocal coach, I can't help but try to help people. And Fifth Harmony, who was then just um, individual contestants, they would come to me, Miss Tara, we, I don't know how I'm going to memorize this as fast. Will you please help me? Do you have any warm ups? And of course, like, yes, I'm happy to help. Like, even though your competition, I, I don't see it that way. Like I just was very willing to help. And the producers would come to me and say, Hey, thank you so much. You know, you're, you know, everybody here is just, you know, really saying how sweet you are and how, you know, it is a competition, but you're so helpful. And we see that and we just really appreciate that about you. And I was like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's what I do for a living. I can't not be that, you know, a rabbit yeah. is a rabbit. I'm a vocal coach. I can't help myself, you know, even if it means helping them to my detriment, it's, it's just what I do. Um, and so, so going through it, it was a very positive experience, but but because of ratings, how they twisted everything around on my takes and just made it seem like I was just this awful, vicious villain when there were plenty of people that were rude and mean without being edited um, to portray that. I don't know why they worked so hard to make people who were mean and inconsiderate seem to be nice and someone who was considerate but just happened to be animated with a strong personality look yeah. so mean. Uh, cause it just couldn't have been farther from the truth. And it, it hurt me deeply because I knew in my heart, like, this is not who I am. And so an example of that, um, just so that, you know, um, just how bad it was when I had my first audition and I sang and LA Reid asked me who, what you heard was, who do you want to take out of the music industry? And I answered Christina Aguilera. That's not the question I was asked. The question I was asked was, who would you like to do a duet with in the music industry? I and I see. said, you know, Aguilera. So he asked someone else later on that day with the same clothing on, who do you want to take out of the music industry? And they took his question, spliced it with my answer, and enter the hate mail and death threats of people around the world who are Christina Aguilera fans, I of which am one of. <laughs> so that was my experience on air. But the filming of it was very positive. And so now that I do these YouTube reactions and um, people get to see who I really am. And, and of course my students yeah. have all known who I really am, my family and friends and all that. It's very vindicating for me because there are some people who recognize me from X Factor and they say, oh, you're, you're so sweet and you're so kind and you're so knowledgeable with your reviews. Thank you so much. And, and it's nice, you know, online to, to finally um, get people to see the real side of who I am unedited because I don't, I don't edit any of my videos. If you notice, they're all in one tape. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> so that's that's who I am. This is who I am. Um, unfortunately, X Factor felt the need to boost their ratings to just make me someone I wasn't. But the truth always ends up setting you free, and what's in darkness eventually does come to light. Great. Okay. At least you learned something, right? <laughs> oh, I learned a lot, and you know, yeah. I'm able to help my students now. Um, you know, Lauren Lott was on American Idol. She's now gone on to do Broadway and is now in feature films. Angelica. Same, same story. We've had students actually in, in the studio represent 
us in every single one of those talent competitions out there worth naming. And I have been able to take what happened to me in a negative way and say, look, when you're asked a question, answer it in one sentence. And when you're finished, put your head down. Don't make any expressions. When you take a breath, put your head down. If you don't want to be heard, scratch your lapel microphone. Like do not give them any information or, or facial expressions that are usable that you don't want them to use. Uh, and they both had very positive experiences on, on both of their shows and, and our other students too. And I consider that a blessing. And if I had to do it again, if that had to happen to me again, personally, to be able to know just how bad it can be so that I can help them, I would have done it the same way. And I would have had the same thing happen to me so that I could keep them from, yeah, I could protect them from that happening to them. Okay, interesting. So after that, you released a single called Walk Away, I guess. Um, yeah. How successful was it and how uh, the success was influenced by your particip participation in X Factor? Was it a big factor? Yeah, so that was really kind of my response musically to what happened. I mean, there's no way you can correct every single negative comment on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter, whatever. There's no way you can respond to the masses and prove. So for me, I've always spoken out musically, and that's true to form how I chose to spoke out again, uh, to speak out again, excuse me. And um, Walk Away was very successful, so much so that actually, ironically, X Factor even shared it <laughs> when I released it. I was like... That's weird, but okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, um, it won some songwriting competitions. It got aired nationally. Uh, the music video got aired nationally um, in many retail outlets and chains um, and has, has made some good passive income. And, and it's um, more, more than anything, uh, forget the success of the song. For me, it was a closure of something that I was able to finally get peace with and wrap my mind around and get right with again and just be able to respond in the way that I always do musically. Um, and I think as a songwriter, what, uh, what's important about that is that it, it's, it speaks to your heart more than anyone else's. It, it spoke to my own heart. And when I teach songwriting to my students, I tell them like, a song is nothing unless it hit home, hits home to you first, because that's how others feel it. You know, you love Adele because she writes from her pain or wrote from her pain, especially in her first album, right? I mean, you, you don't write songs for others. You write songs for you, for others. And that's why Walk Away was very successful. And, and to me, more so than the success, meant so much to me. Okay. So let's talk a bit about Tara Simon Studios now. So why did you create it? That's also a story. <laughs> okay. I never set out to be a vocal coach. In fact... Um, I cringed at the thought um, when really? I was in my, yes, when I was in my early twenties, in fact, even, even earlier than then, um, people would always ask me when I was singing and performing afterwards, they'd come up to me, Oh, you did such a great job. Do you coach? And I'm like, ah. like, it wouldn't be like, Oh, can we hire you for our next event? No, it'd be like, Oh, I have a daughter who really would like love to take lessons with you. And I never uh, intended on being a vocal coach. So it's not like I studied music education. I studied vocal performance. You know, I didn't to get a master's in vocal pedagogy. I took classes in as part of my vocal performance major. Right. And um, so it was just so frustrating to me that this kept coming up. And um, I was living at the time in, uh, in South Carolina and um, this, this family called me up. I don't even know how they found me. I wasn't advertising. Um, and, and they said, we have a son and, and he has Down syndrome. His name is Peter. He's nine. And everywhere we go, we kept getting told no. Uh, his hands are too small because you, you stereotypically their hands are smaller. Um, he can't hit the notes. Um, no, we can't take him. And that made me mad just because I don't, I didn't know them, but I was like, well, um, I did, I do teach piano. So I said, bring him over. I'll listen to him. And if he's good, I'll take him, you know? Um, so he came over and I instantly knew this kid was special. He played, um, I think he played Mozart for me the first time he sat down. And uh, to be quite honest and frank, I, I believed he was a better piano player than I was. And so, at nine. Wow. <laughs> and I told his parents, I said, okay, so um, I'm not sure how far I can take him because he's really, really good. But I can tell you this, I'm never going to be easy on him. And I'm never going to tell him he can't do anything. So let me try to coach him. And it really was more of like a spiteful thing against those people who said that he couldn't. And I wanted to prove that he could. 
um, because I know that feeling, right? And you're constantly being told no as a performer. So it was that that rose up in me. And so we started to take lessons. Um, he memorized a 17 page Chopin piece, I believe, uh, in like weeks. Don't quote me on the, a number of pages, but it was in the teens, very, very long. This kid was a prodigy and the best attitude, most amazing kid. And as I taught Peter, my, my just almost hatred for coaching the idea of it started to melt away. And I, I believe that God used Peter to change my heart towards coaching. And as my heart started to soften and I began to, um, you know, soften up and, and grow towards warm up towards the idea of coaching, somehow more students started coming and more started coming and more started coming. And this was out of my house, you know, I, yeah. this was not an intentional thing. Um, so I moved to Atlanta and, um, and began to grow the business, still going back to South Carolina where I had students as well. And um, I got a call on my way to Atlanta one day that, um, from Peter's mother saying that he had been diagnosed with bone marrow leukemia. And um, would I please come to his first, um, his first radiation and teach him a lesson while he was having radiation? And I said, I'll be there. So I brought my keyboard into the hospital and Peter and I had a lesson and the nurses said, we've never seen such good stats on a, on a kid having radiation. This is amazing. We should do this all the time. Um, Peter, uh, it, there's no one ever that survived bone marrow leukemia with Down syndrome to my knowledge. And um, although Peter did go into remission a year later and he did get to come to the brick and mortar of Tara Simon Studios and he did sit on my piano and I did get to tell him, Peter, I'm going to cry. I, um, I did get to tell him, Peter, this place is here because of you. Oh. Um, sorry. Take your time. He did, um, he did pass away later that year. But it was so sweet for me to, to see him um, once again at the studio and to watch him there. And it was just, um, it was really special for not just me, but for his family too. So, um, so really, PSS exists because I'm a little boy who is just um, amazing. Sorry. Well, it's really hard for me. Amazing, yeah. The, in those moments like this, we realize that music is really, really amazing. And there is a lot of power in actually communicating with music. That's a form of language as well. But there is way more emotions in this. And I saw it on a lot of different cases about um, illness. It can help to heal. But as well, the mind, the soul. And yeah, it's a beautiful story. And yeah. it's such a powerful story to build a company on because then it's not about money. It's really about uh, the impact you're going to have on other people. And that's amazing. That's wonderful. Thank you. So, yeah. And I, I still do actually keep in touch with, with Peter's parents. And, um, and I tell his story whenever I can, because um, one of the dreams he had before he passed was that he, he started posting on YouTube as well, his performances. And, wow. and one of his dreams was to get a million views on YouTube. So we're still working on that um, in his name. And, um, and his parents were just so amazing. And, and I do still have a close relationship with them. But yeah, I mean, it was never about really... Um, it was never an intentional business. It was never about the money. It, it turned out to be about um, building up others, you know, and, and saying that they can instead of allowing someone else that just may not have the security within themselves and their own giftings to say that they can. Um, yeah. Instead of saying they can't and just moving on. And I, I refuse to turn anybody away. We do have students uh, that come to us with special needs um, as a result of that. And, it is a hundred percent feasible for them to improve too, and for them to be better um, with music and and to love it and to thrive and to perform. Um, I don't believe in the word no when it comes to my studio. You do not say that when you walk through those doors. Say it before you get in, because if you say it when you come in, we're having words. You can, and we believe that firmly. Okay. Uh, in one of your videos, you say that you believe uh, singing was ninety percent mental and 10% yeah. talent. Uh, yeah. Could you explain a bit more? Sure. So 
my methodology uh, when it comes to singing is sing smarter, not harder. And it's something that I've developed over the years from multiple really great coaches that I've had the honor and privilege of studying from, both from classical and pop um, and everything. But my, my saying when I say that is really to prove a point that you don't have to be naturally gifted like me to be a good singer. Now there are levels of, of good singing, right? I mean, if you start off not being able to sing on pitch, you're probably never going to sound like Angelica Hale or Lauren Lott or Whitney Houston, yeah. but that's a different level of singing and there are different levels of success in life, right? So I believe, and it's actually a, a clinical fact that only three to 5% of people are actually clinically toned up. They cannot, there's, there is something in their brain that they cannot hear pitch, right? And yeah. there's not a cure for that. There's an, I cannot help you with that, right? But there's also a test that I can give students to find that out. And I've never seen one person ever fail the test in all my years of coaching. And I've been doing this for many years. So when I say singing is 90% mental, 10% talent, what I'm trying to emphasize by saying that is, look, you don't have to start off singing at three and be this prodigy singer to be able to be a good singer. And you don't have to have vibrato or natural pitch right away to learn those things. I've successfully taught those things to many, many students, right? You simply have to have the desire. So it's, it's your thought life so much more than it is your talent life, especially at the beginning, because when you decide, okay, I'm going to give myself over to training, I'm going to commit and I'm, I'm going to work this through, take this journey. Well, of course, you're not going to be to the finish line. You're right at start. You have to walk to it. And that's what lessons are all about. That's what training is all about. And so as soon as I can restructure and, and kind of reframe the student's mind into thinking, hey, I don't have to sound like that right now. In fact, I never do. I have to take what I have and really think about my technique, think about what I'm doing, not how it sounds necessarily. Then all of a sudden, we see progress. And they're like, oh, wow, I, I didn't think I could hit that note, or I've never sang with vibrato before, or oh, I've nev I never thought I could do riffs, and now I can, like, this is amazing, right? Because they're not thinking, yeah. oh, I sound bad, or oh, I'm never going to get that. They're thinking about the process of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, when I looked at your website, uh, I was really surprised of uh, how many uh, things you, you were offering. Like, yeah. uh, you're doing singing, uh, piano lessons, guitar lessons, uh, acting lessons. Uh, also, you have a recording studio, so that's yes. a lot of things. Um, yeah. What did you d decide to have all those different offers? Again, not the part of the plan. <laughs> um, okay. The reason is because um, we only did voice at first, and there were people that took voice lessons from us that would want to do acting, or they'd want to play an instrument, or they would be to the point where they needed to record. And at that point, we would say, okay, well, let's recommend this place to you. We've heard of good things, you know, go here. Uh, this recording studio seems good. We've checked that out a little bit, go here. And no joke, inevitably, nine times out of 10 at least, our students would come back to us in lessons saying, you know, uh, that recording studio wasn't so great. Or, hey, that acting place, I mean, I don't even know why I went like it wasn't good and every time that would happen it would just make me so mad and I'm like you know what fine you trust us we'll make it happen here and so we added acting okay fine you okay. trust us we'll add music lessons here and okay fine you can't find a recording studio that's you know does what they say they're gonna do and turns out fine we'll build one here and so that is why we're full service not because I wanted to but because and I'm not saying that there aren't great people out there right but it took me longer to find those people and refer them than it would to just hire and train great people and build an infrastructure and a space to where they could do everything in house. And, you know, we are a family. The culture of TSS is very much familial. My coaches, they, they're friends with one another. Our students text us, you know, I mean, we are, we are very much, we do three showcases a year. We do extracurricular performances all the time. I mean, we have an awesome culture at TSS and because of that close knit nature of the students to the coaches and the clients, to the coaches, they kind of don't want to go anywhere else anyway. So it just makes sense to do everything there, but we did not plan on it. And like I said, nothing against outside uh, venues. I know that there are a lot of good ones in Atlanta, but once you trust one person, 
it's way easier to just continue on doing whatever else you want to do in the performing arts with that one person than having to go and check out another entity. I mean, it's, it's just the nice thing to do, frankly, and that's why we do it. Yeah, of course. But that's a lot of work. So my next question is, uh, how did you learn um, like entrepreneurship, business, all, this, all those things? That's a great question. Um, I had the privilege of growing up in a household of entrepreneurs. Um, my mom and dad still run a business together. They, um, they're amazing parents. I, I was blessed and lucky to, to have them as examples. And um, my dad is in real estate and, um, and he became a home inspector and they do mold remediation as well for when people buy houses. And so my mom does all the bookkeeping and on all the phones and my dad goes out and he does the job and it's a great pairing of talents. And, and, um, I just grew up homeschooled for a little bit. My mom taught my sister and I at the time, um, instead of going to school. And so I, I grew up listening to her answer the phones and sell the products that my dad would, would, uh, execute to the potential client and I I mean I had it memorized almost well ceilings gutters down south level like all the things that they that they check for and it's funny because I mean before we got big I was my own assistant I have one now but um, when I would answer the phones and I would say what we offer and, and who I am I, I had her in the back of my mind and, and my parents and my spirit like because of what I grew up watching so I never took any classes on it I just I had the good old first first party perspective of having the honor of watching my parents grow and maintain a successful business while I was growing up. Awesome. <laughs> That's yeah. really great. And yeah. uh, I, I, I also know the importance of having a good network um, yeah. to actually learn those stuff. Uh, so how did you go about it? How did you grow your network? That's hard. Growing a network is difficult, um, especially before, uh, I don't know how they did it, uh, especially before social media boom and everything. I mean, I remember my, my mom and dad, uh, would, my mom would bake these really special cookies that she'd make and my dad would take them to realtors offices and like shake hands and give out cookies and be like, hey, I offer inspections and they, he'd get to know the people, right? They get to know the people that would hire him. Uh, and it was very grassroots. And so growing up seeing that, I believe in a, in a grassroots approach too, even though we do um, a lot of social media stuff and, and we're very present on in the digital world. I I very much believe in, uh, in personal time and so uh, whenever there's something that I can donate lessons to, um, children's schools or silent auctions in Atlanta, I do. And whenever there's a place where I can sing and donate my, my talent to for good causes, I grew up doing that. I continue to do that now. Um, I think it's important that networking is slash giving back. Um, so I feel like networking is a lot more successful when you go in it in in the networking hat, so to speak, with the intention to serve someone instead of the intention to get something. Um, I do believe that if you go in with that intention, you end up getting to full back what you put out. And that shouldn't be the goal either, right? If yeah. you know, knowing that, like it, it could be that, that's your ambition. But for me, if I'm going to an event, um, yes, I know I'm gonna meet people, but my intention is to serve as best I can and to, and to give back in that way. Um, and so I, I, um, actually plan to do a lot more of that in 2019. I had a baby a couple of years ago and, and that is, that takes over your life. It yes. can. And, Congratulations. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, but networking is difficult. And I think personally, um, yes, you need to do SEO and social media marketing and all that stuff. But especially if you have a brick and mortar for those of you who may be listening, who are business owners or thinking of starting a business, the street where you plan on being is your most important street. And you need to know every single person on it. You need to go and shake hands. It's not just an email. It's not a phone call. Um, get your brochures out, get your card out, maybe get um, some a, a cute little trinket or something that you can give for free and just say, hey, I'm here. Um, local schools are on. If you serve kids um, with your product, you want to build relationships with those entities and make yourself a familiar brand that they know and think of and they can trust. Wow. Okay. That was a lot of advice. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, because uh, we don't immediately think about the fact that we can grow a business in the music industry. Uh, like right away, we think about being an artist, performing. So it's really nice to have this view on it. Um, yeah. So I was wondering how big is TSS? How many coaches, how many students? 
Oh, wow. So I have not even counted students lately. Um, I know we're in the hundreds, but the exact number I don't, I probably should check at some point. Um, it's been very busy in the fall because um, that's when a lot of students come back from having a break in the summer. And so you're just, you're just in survival mode. Oh, excuse me. You're just oh, no in worries. survival mode um, in taking the students and making sure everybody's good. Uh, right now, I think we're at 10 coaches and um, uh, a lot of our coaches coach multiple art areas. For instance, um, my, one of my head coaches, Heather, she coaches piano voice and acting and songwriting. So, yeah. you know, between, if you count that, you know, in multiplicity of what the coach coaches, there's probably 20, but within one person, there's four art areas, you know, and then we have a dedicated acting coach, dedicated voiceover coach, dedicated guitar, piano, all those, but there are quite a few of us that, uh, that coach almost all of what we offer. Um, depending on who you go with. Uh, and they're all hand trained by me um, extensively. So it, it takes a while. I could stand to have more coaches, but I'm very picky. Um, one of the, the caveats to working with me and for me is that you must be a working professional it's in some capacity in the music and entertainment industry. And then once I find that out, then I have to figure out if you are passionate about people and are trainable. So then, then we decide if you are a fit to coach and then we train for months until I know that you're good to go. Basically the, the, the model is they are me with a different face um, at a less expensive price so that I can kind of multiply myself. And, and, um, and I think that we've done a really good job. Our coaches are amazing. And I know I've done my job when people request them, you know, and that's, yeah. uh, that's special for me. And, um, I'm not, I'm not the prideful owner who's like, Oh, I, I only want people to want me and then just settle. No, like I want people to prefer Heather or prefer Jeremy or prefer David. I want them to do that because that means that I've done my job well. Great. So do, do you do online as well? Yes. In fact, I just coached my first student in Singapore this morning. Uh, it was 9 a.m. for me, 9 p.m. for her. She did an awesome Great. job. We've got students everywhere. Um, Africa, London, Singapore now, uh, all over the U.S. Um, we've had students move three times and still take lessons with us. So they've, we've coached them in multiple different states, uh, same student. And, um, and it's been a huge blessing um, to be able to impact lives, not just now in the nation, but in the world as well. Great. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So uh, you just recently added new videos to your YouTube channel. Yes. Um, it has been like uh, almost a month. Um, I was wondering what was the impact of those videos on your business and what you, where you were wanting to go with those videos? What's your goals? I feel like everything I've told you, it seems to be like an accident. This, this wasn't intentional either. The, you, so I had started to post um, on Instagram these, these vocal tips and tricks and hacks, and it was very content rich. It was high value. It was very much like solid technique. Um, and it was original content. And it got responses, but nothing like these YouTube reactions. And one day, out of almost just frustration, my social media guy, TJ, and I were like, let's just do a reaction real quick. You know, like we have some time, we finished what we were doing early and we did. And you know, it gets 80,000 something views and like yeah. 200 subscribers to now 11,000 and counting. And I just sit back and I laugh because that's my life. Like that's how God works in my life. I, it's just, everything is not, didn't mean to like, you, you, you know, I can't take the credit for it really. And so it's just funny to me. And of course it's impacted. I mean, you're so much more exposed to people that around the world that you wouldn't normally be exposed to. And, and that's, you know, I, I'm, that's how I taught the, the person in Singapore this morning. And I am releasing an eight week course. So I find that this, this little happy accident here is going to be great because it's going to help me expose the course to a lot of people who may not be able to afford weekly lessons privately, but they could afford a one-time payment that's way less expensive for eight weeks of training with me. So it's all modules that's video interactive and that I've created. It's all, it's all of what you would get in private lessons, but in an eight week course. And it's the foundations of my methodology, which is sing smarter, not harder. So it's for those who are maybe singers who are on the beginner end. They may need to know like, how to produce sound, what, what it's called, the proper terminology, where sound comes from, how to be dynamic. We talk about belting in there. It, it's also for singers who have been singing for a while, but they may not have really studied. They may not have taken lessons and they're feeling wear on their voice and they're feeling like, 
uh, you know, it's costing me a lot and I'm getting hoarse and I, I think I might need to know where my sound is coming from and maybe redirect it a little bit. It's definitely for that person too. And so I think that the YouTube videos are really going to um, help boost the exposure for that course as well and, and hopefully help me reach a lot more people that normally wouldn't be able to take from me in any other way. Yeah, I was really impressed to see that it was only one tech. We were talking about that earlier. Uh, yeah, it seems really easy for you to actually comment on other singers. I guess you did it a lot, right? Every day, all day for the past, I don't know how many years. So it is funny, you know, the other videos that we would record, I would write the script out because I wanted to make sure all the technology and all of the technique and everything that I was saying was perfect. And it was so stressful. I'd be like so anxious about it. And when we do these, it, it's literally like I could do them in my sleep because I, this is what I do in lessons. You know, I, my job is to constructively critique and it's such a sweet spot for me. And I, I've never, I've never done any, any double takes as far as I can, I remember from filming. I think it's all, every single one that we've done is just one take. Awesome. That's very really yeah. impressive. And, um, in the future, uh, I guess you will continue doing reactions videos because it's so successful. Uh, yeah. But maybe you have other plans for videos that may be in the different topics, maybe some tips on singing or something else. You're so smart. Exactly. So once we have um, a large subscriber base who are looking for more in-depth information, we're sort of laying the foundation for that now. I'll definitely love to get back to giving more content-rich, original, uh, technical training to them for free on YouTube um, and take comments and, and answer questions like that as well, for sure. Um, that is right now what the eight-week course is going to be doing, but 100%, um, I definitely want want to hopefully have just as much desire and demand for that as as it would be for the reaction videos but you know it's funny the reaction videos are are a great vehicle for that even now because in I, do, I read every comment and I try to respond as much as I can and it's like there's over 600 comments on one video so it's like a full-time job but I do read them and I respond um, especially to the ones that are asking me questions like one one little kid it must have been like under 10 right? I really want to take lessons, but I'm scared to ask my parents and, you know, so, and I'm, I'm writing back, like you never get anything if you, you don't ask, you know, or someone said, I, I have a really big problem. Every time I try to sing, I yawn, you know, help, what do I do? Okay. Well, let me write back to you and, and tell you like, let's, let's figure this out. You know, so it's actually prompting those technical questions, even though I'm not necessarily talking about, um, technical things to that person there it's it's being brought up in the comments which is really cool I love that yeah um, so I wanted to know a bit more about uh, your experience coaching uh, Angelica uh, okay. because um, she's really really young so I guess it was really different and she is very very talented so what was your process to actually teach her sure um, Angelica is a joy to coach she's truly really a treat and um and her parents are so so very supportive of her her number one fans um are are eva and james for sure and me right behind them um but um i wouldn't ever try to to fight them for that position but angelica is just as determined and driven as she as she is talented and again we talked about that from the very beginning when you have that combination in a student especially so rare to have it in someone so young is really quite an anomaly. And I'm, I'm honored and humbled to be able to witness that and to be able to grow that. It's a really big privilege for me. Um, they came to me when they, when they got on AGT and um, they said, we, we just, we need your help. We need her to sound amazing. And we've, we've heard you and we want your help, like, especially with vocal design and melodic lines and, and all those things and keeping her voice healthy because it was a very demanding show. Um, a lot of late nights, a lot of song changes last minute, a lot of song memorization, a lot of vocal design on my part um, to make the songs interesting and fit her voice perfectly and really showcase what she had to offer. Um, and so we worked hard. We worked really hard. And, you know, her parents were right there, ready to capitalize on all that exposure right after. And so, I mean, I, I saw her yesterday online and she's in LA right now. Um, 
and she's she's got she's got something really exciting coming up actually be watching on the television I can't say what but she'll be on there very very soon um, and uh, very we're training for that right now um, but teaching her is a joy she is she is a hard worker she practices when I say to do something she goes and she works on it until it's done and I'm really hard on her I, I don't treat her like a child um, if she misses a note or if she's flat or if she didn't do the run that I design I'm like and she's like, I know, <laughs> and she goes back and she does it, but never discouraged, uh, never negative, never depressed about it. Super positive. Always like, okay, let's do it. Yeah. And you know, we, we dance and celebrate her victories and, and, um, and we expect excellence out of her and she expects excellence out of her, which is why she's excellent. So it's a joy. Wow. I'm super honored to, to be a part of her growth. Awesome. Okay. So let's talk about singing now. A bit more specific. Um, okay. So, can you please tell, tell us a bit about the mixed voice? Because that's something I guess a lot of singers don't know about, and I learned about it really recently. So, okay. yeah, how? What is the mixed voice, and how do you train it? Oh, the all elusive mixed voice. Um, so, there are people who are natural mixers, and and I guess the best analogy I can use to help people understand what mix is and what your voice does when it goes to mix. It's like you're taking um, a jacket and you're putting it on you and it's got a zipper on it. You attach the bottom, right? And then you take the zipper and you pull it up. So the two sides get attached into one, right? Yeah. This is chat voice. And as you zip up, we're in mix here and you zip up more and we're in head. So it's this zip up feeling within your, within your range of, a change in register and usually for most people there's a big gap so I'll give you a sonic example um, a big gap would be uh, you hear the change right instead yes. of uh, where it just kind of zipped up the second time it's really difficult though to train the, the latter the second one because when you're in your mix it's just that it's a mix between your chest and your head voice mixed together so it's very elusive in the in the placement of it like physically, I can feel in my chest voice where I am right now. And I can feel in my head voice where I am right now. It's very pure, right? But in my mix, ah, it's like here-ish, right? It's like this no man's land place that's very difficult to point, like put your sound there. I can say to any singer, put your sound here, put your sound here. But mix, I've got to be like, put your sound-ish, right? And by the way, everybody's face and skull is shaped a little different and so their resonation cavities are a little bit bigger smaller wider thinner whatever so it may not be placed exactly where it is for me for you so you have to go based on analogies based on repetition and based on certain exercises that i've designed to force the issue to kind of continue massaging that area just like if you have a lump of cookie dough and it's really lumpy and you take a rolling pin and you roll it out it's like this is never going to work, right? It, it looks like a mess at first, but you keep rolling and you keep rolling and then eventually it's smooth, right? It's the same exact thing if you're working your mix, working that zip up, if you're working that chest to mix to head, you have to continue through that break and massage it and massage it until finally it smooths out and you can trust the movement because if there's stress or strain there, it's not going to zip up. The zipper will get stuck just like it does if it gets caught in fabric, right? So yeah. if it's you would zip if it's not relaxed it's not going to zip up so it's really difficult mixing is a difficult topic to coach I like it because um, I was when I was training with other coaches they were so vocal pedagogically technical that they didn't give me analogies like I just gave you to have an image to try to emulate when I was doing it and so I had to kind of figure it out on my own I was trained very well but I was trained hard and it was really on my own in my own practice where it happened by accident. And I was like, wait, I don't, let me see if I can repeat that again. That was amazing. And then I figured it out. I was like, Oh, I wish they would have just said this and I would have gotten it. Right. So yeah. it's not just a matter of like showing me cause they'd sing it for me all day long. Like, I'm glad you can do it. Congratulations. I'm trying to over here and I don't understand what you're doing. So part of why we're so successful at TSS is because I've struggled with that and I'm able to give analogies to say, look, I know how you're feeling right now, but if you can just think of this, if you can just trust to do that real quick, then let's see how you turn out. And, and usually it's, it's correct. So it's analogies, it's, it's mental pictures and images and it's repetition to teach mix. 
Okay, so do you have as well an analogy for breathing? Because it's really hard for most people. Yes. So um, we like in the studio, we, we talk a lot about breathing for sure. And um, one of the analogies I like to give my students, young or old, is a front side back breath. As if you are filling up a tire. You know, when you're swimming in the pool and you've got that inner tube yeah. around you, if you have this imaginary inner tube, you don't just want to breathe in the front and fill that up. You want to try to in your imagination, act as if there are side and back compartments for air. And when you breathe, you breathe down into your belly button, but you also breathe around. Try to fill up even your back full of air so that you have a full, full, nice, deep, low breath in which to start phonating from. So that's just one of the analogies we use. Okay, interesting. Um, maybe something you, I don't know if you thought about it with your students, but about really, really high notes, like whistle notes, uh, or falsetto. Um, yeah. Is it possible for everyone? Um, I, I don't think so. And here's why. Everybody's vocal cords, just like I was saying about the shape of uh, the anatomy of a person, there are certain people's vocal cords who have um, a thicker uh, kind of viscosity to them. And there are some who are thinner, which is why you speak in a certain timbre, I speak in a certain timbre, a woman I may meet on the street might talk like this, you know? And, and that's just how, how she is. I've met really low alto girls who talk like this, and I'm kind of somewhere in between, right? That all has to do, the vocal production all has to do with the thickness of our cords and the elasticity of our cords. So anatomically speaking, no, uh, I would not be successful in teaching everybody whistle tone. That's why it's special, right? That's, yes. and, and the same for really low notes. However, I can increase anybody's range. So you may start off with an octave's worth of range, and when we train, you may end up with two or three. You may not ever get to whistle tone, but you definitely are increasing your range. And so it's all relative. You know, if um, Ariana Grande can hit whistle notes, she's got that kind of higher, lighter, brighter voice even when she's speaking. I don't know how low she can go. I may be able to go lower than her. She may be able to go higher than me and vice versa. So there's always a give and take to everybody's giftings. And just because one person can go and whistle doesn't make them a better singer, you may be able to go lower than them. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly where I wanted to go. So I guess it's the same thing uh, with the low notes, that maybe everyone has a different range. And uh, yeah, maybe you have really, really low notes, but no high notes, but uh, yep. okay. Um, I wanted to ask you how important is it uh, to learn music theory in order to do runs, in order to uh, harmonize for those things? So they are not the same. So um, it is, I think you're going to have a way easier time if you play an instrument to harmonize for sure, because you are much more aware of chord structure. And when you harmonize, you're essentially doing inversions or uh, according of the root, which is the, the, melody note okay so if you're doing a harmony of let's say mary had a little lamb and i'm singing mary had a little lamb in order to do the third up i'd go mary had a little lamb and if i wanted to do the fifth up i'd go mary had a little lamb right yeah and if i wanted to invert that i could go down you know from past melody so if mary had a little lamb is the is the melody i could go mary had a little lamb and I'm going down. And you can invert harmonies, you can do all sorts of things, but if you know chord structure based on being a pianist or a guitarist, or musician of any kind, you're much more acutely aware of where you are in the melodic line harmonization wise. Now, runs are a little different. I do know singers who are great at running and riffing who do not play an instrument, much to my chagrin. So um, like Lauren Lott, she does not play the piano. I could kill that girl. <laughs> but she's an amazing vocalist. She can tear paint off walls. She can run. She can riff. Now, she's not a huge fan of it. I make her because she can do it and she's amazing. But it's not her comfort zone but she can do it and she doesn't play an instrument. So I can't say that you have to play an instrument to be able to run and riff, you don't. It makes it easier, I do believe, because again, knowing scales, you're a lot more aware of going from the major to the minor and if that works within that chord underneath you. Um, and so your accuracy and your ease of riffing and running and your complexity of the riffs and runs that you design probably would be better. But that doesn't mean you can't if you don't play something. Yeah, so about harmonization, you talked about thirds and fifths. 
Um, but there is a lot more to it. So maybe, but in modern music, we don't hear a lot more in harmonization. So right. have you ever used like sevens, nines, or more complex chords in harmonization? Yes. I'm, in fact, I, I comment on them in, in YouTube videos and I call them crunchy chords. And yeah. I, I love the crunch. I'm all about the crunch. Um, and I do that in my songs a lot. Um, I took a lot of uh, jazz training in college and some choral conducting and a lot of classical training too. And so I'm a, I'm a theory geek, essentially. And so because of that, I really enjoy using um, that that technique and, and that theory to make my harmonies more interesting and and more layered um, and I'm big into harmony stacks as well so if I'm recording I never just do like one vocal take I'm always stacking my harmonies at least three times for a nice full sound um, and just doing as many cool inversions as I can I'm all about it in fact honestly I usually get stuck singing lead when I sing but I much prefer singing backup so that I can do harmonies okay um, one other thing I'm really curious about is how can you work on your tone? Because it's kind of hard to hear yourself because you sound different than what people hear. So do you have any tips about that? 100%. So one thing, I, th I would say the one thing that's the most helpful when trying to be aware of the timbre and texture and tone of your own voice is to record yourself and listen back. Because you're right, when you are singing, your inner ear is hearing the production inside of you, and then you're projecting sound out and then hearing that ambient noise as well. So it is different. And that's why a lot of times people kind of plug one ear to hear, but it's still, it's still not the same as what the listener is hearing, at least to us when we're singing. So I always tell my singers, um, listen, if you, if you feel like you are pitchy or you're not singing with a, a rich enough quality, if you're kind of nasal or thin and you want to start manipulating your tone a bit, you got to know what you need to change. And in order to know what you need to change, you have to hear yourself the way an audience hears you. So record yourself, even if it's in your room, you know, record yourself, listen back, see what you did or didn't like, see what you want to change, record that again and listen and compare the two. Don't just delete it. See what got changed. See what audible differences you can hear. Okay, great. And something I actually learned from your videos that's kind of related uh, is about uh, the, way you, the way you pronounce words. Uh, yes. I found that really interesting. I never heard about it. That, okay. for example, do not pronounce the R's at the end of the words. That's yes. really interesting. Uh, not closing your mouth to keep the pitches right. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you talk a bit more about this? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so it's all about space, right? When we sing, we're trying to create more space all the time because that's what allows the air to come out more freely. It's what keeps it from being stopped up. And I gave that analogy of the hose um, on YouTube about it getting kinked, right? And so we want to keep that air free flowing because if it's not free flowing, then there's going to be eventual strain inevitably. So when I'm, when I'm having a singer sing something like the word shoulders, which is one of the things we, we talk about on YouTube, um, that R, in order to say an R, I'm having to close my mouth, right? And sometimes the note that we're singing is needing a lot of space. Maybe I'm singing shoulders, and that sounded kind of nice, and I'm thinking R, but if I say it the way I'm speaking it, sing it the way I'm speaking it, shoulders, it's like totally stopped up here. Right. So I have to give myself more space. I'm going up in my melody. So any extreme or higher low needs more space. I got to give myself more space. Shoulders. And it's so much more relaxed and easy to get it out. But it still sounds to you like shoulders. You knew what I was saying. Yeah. Actually, it, I sounded like like really closed off and more kind of country sounding with the first one uh, or the rather the, the harder R. But with the harder R, I'm simply singing it like I speak it. And that's the big misconception. And that's why I'm big on these, these consonants being omitted is that we cannot sing the way we speak. We need to have a conversational tone to our voice and not sound affected, but we don't open our mouth much when we, when we speak, when we sing, we need to. And so that's the rule that I'm trying to impart is that you gotta always be thinking, how can I capitalize on more space? Because that's what my voice is asking for. Yeah. I think it goes as well into the 90% mental because it's a, a lot more thinking that we might expect. So that's yeah. really, really interesting. Uh, yeah. So the last question uh, would be, what advice would you give to someone that wants to 
have a career in the music industry um, that has a good level in like uh, instrument practice or that knows how to sing, but the basis, uh, sure. what should they do? Okay, so you would never go to the Olympics or be even a, a competitor in the Olympics, make it that far, and you definitely would never place and get a medal without a coach. You have no business trying to compete with the best of the best in this industry without being trained by someone. It doesn't have to be me, but it needs to be someone who knows what they're doing, who has your best interests at heart, who has no ambition of their own but to help you. That's the very first thing you need to do. You cannot do this alone. You have to believe in yourself the most, more than anyone, but you cannot do this alone. So my very first and most important piece of advice would be get yourself someone that you can trust, even if it's a mentor, but preferably a vocal coach if you're looking to sing, because they're gonna be about you and your vocal health. Their biggest priority is how you're feeling vocally and how you're growing vocally and how competitive you are vocally so that when you're going out and auditioning, you're booking those roles. Because I guarantee you, the people that you're sitting next to waiting in that room or in that line, they're training. They may even be training with me. So you're at a huge disadvantage, right, if, if you go into battle with no armor on and your coach is your armor and you definitely need one. The second is to never ever give up. You have to have that stick to we talked about. Be training your instrument, but perseverance and persistence is key. You need to be healthy. You need to be eating right, you need to be exercising, you need to have uh, physical stamina. You need to be keeping yourself up and looking presentable. You are a product. When you sing and when you're an artist, you are the product. Just like this is a product, you, you are a product. And you're only as good as the execution of your product, how good your product is, and you're only as good as how well you sell that product. And a lot of artists fall short on that second part. They're really great products, but they're terrible business people. They want to wake up late, they want to just sing for a living, and they have no idea how to sell themselves as the music business portion of it. And again, a lot of vocal coaches just teach you how to sing. We do all of those things. We are half done when you are a competitive product at my studio. It's our responsibility. We take it very seriously to equip and show you how to sell yourself, what to do, how do you go and get gigs, how to, who to call at restaurants, how to create a set list, how to get musicians, how to rehearse them, how to, what to wear, how to talk between your songs at sets, how to you know, promote your EP that you recorded while you're gigging, you know? What, how to ask for tips. I mean, everything, everything. It's super important. Your business, if you're an artist and more artists, um, I would like to see treat, treating themselves as artists rather than just singers. You're an artist if you can sell yourself and sing and make a living at it. I think a lot of people call them artists nowadays because it sounds glamorous, but they're forgetting half of the side of what a real artist is. Yeah, it's almost like entrepreneurship, right? <laughs> 100%. Not for. 100%. You are your own business. You may not, this is a brick and mortar right? I mean, you don't need a building. You are the brick and mortar. You're a walking, moving brick and mortar. And how are you keeping it up? How are you selling yourself? It there, makes all the difference in the world between someone booking you and someone booking someone else. That's amazing. Thanks a lot for all your tips. Uh, yes. So where can people find you on your website, Tara Simon Studios? They can book uh, lessons with you and with your coaches. Uh, yes. So on YouTube as well, Tara Simon Studios. Yep. YouTube, Google, Tara Simon Studios. We're on YouTube. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. Any of that can be searched by Tara Simon Studios. The website is tarasimonstudios.com. Uh, you can reach me there personally as well. And, you know, subscribe to the YouTube channel, watch the videos, um, you know, get free content first, you know, get this interview, learn about us, learn about the culture that we're trying to build. This is, this is not really about getting more students for me. It's about creating a culture of awareness and knowledge and inspiring people to move forward with their dreams in an educated and knowledgeable, practical way. Great. Uh, just a quick side note. Uh, you are using Google Plus. I think I saw that. Uh, yes. Why? <laughs> Is it working? <laughs> why? Um, you know, we actually get some inquiries from there. People, um, through okay. that, I guess you can, you can somehow text a nom, like there's a number that's a sort of a generic number and it reaches me uh, or reaches my assistant. And so people can use that as well to inquire. And, and we, we have that, that from time to time. Um, I don't know, you know, much more about it other than that. It's just one more, one more thing. Okay. You know, I do all the things on online. So. Okay. So thank you a lot for being here. It was a pleasure. Thank and you. yeah, I wish you a, a lot of great things happening in the future.
Thank you, Simon. It was a pleasure meeting you. Thanks so much for the awesome questions today. Yeah. See ya. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Go on and try.